Good morning. I'm Stephen Lee. I'm an elder at First Presbyterian Church of Mesquite, and I'm also one of the teachers of the Discipleship Sunday School class today. Today we continue with our study of the Gospel of John, and I'd like to remind you that our curriculum is based upon the Daily Bible Study Series by Professor William Barclay, and that we're using the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible for our scripture readings. We just have one short scripture reading today, and it's John 17, verses 6 through 8. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Jesus gives us a definition of the work that he did. He says to God, I have made your name known. Now, there are two great ideas here, both of which would be quite clear to those who heard this saying for the first time. First, there's an idea which is an essential and characteristic idea of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, name is used in a very special way. It does not mean simply the name by which a person is called. Name means the whole character of the person insofar as it can be known. The psalmist says, those who know your name put their trust in you. That from Psalm 9, verse 10. Clearly, that does not mean that those who know what God has called will trust him. It means that those who know what God is like, those who know his character and nature, will be glad to put their trust in him. The psalmist says, take some, some take pride in chariots and some in horses, but our pride is in the name of the Lord our God. That from Psalm 20, verse 7. This means that he can trust God because he knows what God is like. The psalmist also says, I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters, that from Psalm 22, verse 22. This was a psalm which the Jews believed to be a prophecy of the Messiah and his work. And it means that the Messiah's work would be to declare to his fellow men and women what God is like. It's the vision of Isaiah that in the new age, my people shall know my name. Isaiah 52, verse 6. That is to say that in the golden age, people will know fully and truly what God is like. So when Jesus says, I have made your name known, he is saying, I have enabled people to see what the real nature of God is like. It's another way of saying, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. That from earlier in the book of John, chapter 14, verse 9. It's Jesus' supreme claim that in him we see the mind, the character, and the heart of God. Second, there's another idea here. In later times, when the Jews spoke of the name of God, they meant the sacred four-letter symbol, the tetragram, as it is now called, I-H-W-H or Y-H-W-H. The name was so sacred that it was never pronounced except by the high priest when he went into the Holy of Holies, and that just on the Day of Atonement. These four letters stand for the name Yahweh. We sometimes speak about Jehovah, and the change in the vowels is due to the fact that the vowels of Jehovah are those of Adonai, which means my Lord. In the Hebrew alphabet, there are no vowels at all. Later, the vowel sounds were shown by little signs put above and below the consonants. 
The four letters YHWH were so sacred that the vowels of Adonai were put below them. When the reader came to IHWH or YHWH, he read not Yahweh, but Adonai. That is to say, in the time of Jesus, the name of God was so sacred that ordinary people were not even supposed to know it, much less speak it. God was the remote, invisible king whose name was not for ordinary men and women to speak. So Jesus is saying, I have told you God's name. That name, which is so sacred, can be spoken now because of what I have done. I have brought the remote, invisible God so close that even ordinary mortals can speak to him and take his name upon their lips. It's Jesus' great claim that he showed the true nature and the true character of God. And I think that's true in that Jesus taught us to call God Father. And that makes it very plain for me. And I hope it does for you too. Jesus brought him so close that the humblest Christians can call him by name. This passage always sheds an, an illuminating light on the meaning of discipleship. First, discipleship is based upon the realization that Jesus came forth from God. Disciples are essentially people who have realized that Jesus is God's voice and that in his deeds we see God's action. Disciples are those who see God in Jesus and are aware that no one in all the universe is as one with God as Jesus is. Second, discipleship issues in obedience. Disciples are those who keep God's word as they hear it in Jesus. They have accepted the mastery of Jesus. So long as we wish to do what we like, we cannot be disciples. Discipleship requires submission. Third, discipleship is something which is destined. The twelve were given to Jesus by God. In God's plan, they were destined for discipleship. That does not mean that God destined some to be disciples and some to refuse discipleship. Think of it this way. Parents dream great dreams for their children. They work out a great future for them, but children can refuse that future and go their own way. Likewise, a teacher may think out a great future for a student, but the student can lazily or selfishly refuse the offered task. If we love someone, we are always dreaming of that person's future and planning for greatness, but the dream and the plan can be frustrating. There is throughout this whole passage a ringing confidence about the future in the voice of Jesus. He was with his disciples, the men God had given him. He thanked God for them, and he never doubted that they would carry on the work that he had given them to do. They were 11 uneducated peasants, but that was good enough for Jesus, for in those 11 he trusted the continuance of God's work on earth. Jesus had the confidence which springs from God. He was not afraid of small beginnings, and he was not pessimistic about the future. Jesus had two things, belief in God and belief in humanity. It's most uplifting to think that Jesus put his trust in people just like us. We too must never be daunted by human weakness or by small beginnings. We too must go forward with confident belief in God and in one another. Then we will never be pessimists. Because with these two beliefs, the possibilities of life are infinite. Thanks for joining me again today. God bless each and every one of you.